Rachel Altman, welcome to the Polycom podcast. Thank you for having me here. Today we are going to discuss the strange behaviors and biases of people and how your consultancy can uh, help companies navigate to better understand them. Let's start with uh, some uh, thought-provoking questions. To what extent are humans uh, rational? In order to answer this, I think we should go to the neoclassical thoughts and the traditional economic models, um, which assumes that humans are rational. And it's built on this conceptualized man of the homo economicus, which is a theoretical figurative human being who has certain qualities, such as being fully self-interested, having full information and being perfectly rational and always maximizing his own utility. And economic thought has been built on this assumption. And over time, um, there's been more and more empirical evidence that people actually don't um, decide according to, to this homo economicus model. And we tend to deviate from this. And we are actually um, boundedly rational. So we, we operate within bounded rationality, um, which was introduced by Herbert Simon. And this means that um, we tend to satisfy. So because we have a lot of limitations from time limitations, cognitive capacity, and we don't have full and complete information in different contexts, we tend to stop at a good enough solution, which is what satisficing is. And because of this, we tend to rely on heuristics. And heuristics are these mental shortcuts and rules of thumb that um, govern our daily decisions, and um, they help us ease the cognitive load. And because we rely on these heuristics, we tend to go to cognitive biases. And these cognitive biases are systematic deviations from rational choice. And this is all around us. And humans are full of committing different types of cognitive biases. And this is where um, we go against rationality and working within bounded rationality. And another interesting thing here is people make thousands and thousands of decisions each day. So we make approximately 35,000 decisions a day. And there's even a division between system one and system two. So there's this fast, um, intuitive decision-making based on experience. And then there is this slower system two decision-making, which is much more logical and reflective. But 90% of decisions are in system one. And this is especially where we tend to fall for these cognitive biases. So this is what behavioral science deals with. And based on this, we're trying to divert away from the economic assumption of rationality and operate within this bounded rationale model where we take into consideration that we have emotions, that we're impulsive, and we are bounded by our context and, and our decisions and have a lot of um, cognitive um, limitations as well. Do you think it's a problem that we are not like 100% rational? Absolutely not. So that is why heuristics are there. It's partially evolutionary that um, it's not possible and it wouldn't be optimal in every single decision making or every time you make a choice. I mean, you make hundreds of choices a day um, to have to optimize your decision. So having to see what is the maximum utility from each decision decision, whether when you're purchasing a product or when you're choosing what to eat, you shouldn't optimize every time because you wouldn't have enough time capacity. So this is actually a mental shortcut that helps you make good decisions and easier decisions. But of course, because of this, you have to sometimes fall for cognitive biases that goes against the rationality um, assumption. But when you think about like uh, conspiracy theories and these kinds of like really crazy stuff, how can you like avoid this as a human or should you avoid it? Or, or how can you make in, in, in those contexts like a better de decision? Yeah, I think that's that's a little bit different here. So um, conspiracy theories could be lack of understanding and lack of knowledge on certain um, areas. And it's obviously hard for people to filter the amount of information that's exposed to us on the internet and everywhere. So I feel like um, it's not as easy answer on how you can avoid this. I think it, obviously a lot of this is education, but a lot of this is also um, how we can um, provide better news sources and how we can better filter through this so that um, don't have fake information and stuff. But I don't think that this goes into the biases. So that is not necessarily because of biases. However, there is um, some aspects of people tending to be um, have biased assimilation, which means that you're more likely to um, agree with information that is in line with your own preferences. So there is a lot of different concepts here as well that we should tackle in order to try to optimize information processing and decision making as a result. And uh, how can we build like a better society if we have biases or, or should we learn this in school or, or do you have like any thoughts about this? Whether we should learn about biases in school? Or? Yeah, yeah, or some because I, I think if, if we would know, know, I think a little bit better about ourselves, probably we would make better choices. Or you, you, you think we would need to know more about our biases or, or have yeah. some better knowledge? Or what do you think would be important to have like a better society? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it starts from economics. And actually, um, this is a little bit later than so it's in university years, but in some cases, high school as well. I think what's important is to consider these assumptions as well and start building in behavioral science and behavioral economics into the classical economic model. So I think that is something that's been ongoing. It's obviously um, still a lot of work to be done, but that's something I've also experienced studying economics in my undergraduate degree. This is where I was introduced to um, behavioral science. So I think it's very important to um, step away a little bit from this homo economicus model, even though people don't actually think that we don't make mistakes, it just means that on average we tend to make rational decisions. And I think it's really important to start, as you said, teaching about these biases, teaching about our cognitive limitations, and understanding our own decision-making process better. But I'm thinking that in high school this might be a little bit early to, to really? add in. I mean, it could be in um, towards the end of high school. But I feel like people, especially who study economics or finance or other similar areas, should definitely be introduced to behavioral science, at least to some degree. And do you think this knowledge should be like like for everybody? Would it be useful to know like like the basics of economics in, in, in high school, uh, not just literature and math? I think absolutely. I actually had economics in high school, but I studied abroad. Um, and I think it is extremely useful to have some understanding of basic economics. And I think that in 12th grade or 11th grade, it's absolutely um, possible to introduce economics. And then in that courses, I think we could already introduce at least some courses or modules on behavioral science or behavioral economics, if you want to kind of narrow the scope. Because... The main difference is behavioral economics is the intersection of psychology and economics, while behavioral science is a little bit of a wider scope and more cross-disciplinary. So it also includes neuroscience and other areas. So that might be a little bit too um, too much to introduce in high school. But I think some basics of behavioral economics and the intersection of psychology would definitely be very, very practical. And do you think uh, somebody who is working at the stock exchange, so like a broker, is, is learning about this stuff or this is brand new for them? I mean, there is a whole other discipline within this is behavioral finance. Um, I don't know if they're actually learning about it. I think today, so people who are coming out of university today are learning about this. I think people who came out from university 10 or more years ago or five or more years ago, I don't think that they have been introduced to this. But today, more and more, there is a scope and even people within finance degrees do learn behavioral finance specifically. So, yes, that is quite um, quite increasing in popularity as well. And do you see some patterns in, in real life when uh, all the people are like surprised and you are like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is behavioral science. So this is like normal thing. So like there was like the game, GameStop stock and, and there were like the really crazy stuff that most of the people I think were surprised. And you were like, oh, yeah, this is how it, the world works. I think we can bring this to cognitive biases a little bit because um, there's so many different cognitive biases that we fall to. And a lot of these are usually played with experiments or games, and that's when you see, oh, I'm falling for that cognitive bias as well. And actually, we have a couple of bias we could go through today. For example, the anchoring bias. And the anchoring um, bias is the idea that when you're introduced or to an information, a piece of information, you tend to anchor on this information, even if this is completely irrelevant, and you tend to form your judgment based on this. So this is actually an example by um, Kahneman and Tversky, and this was an experiment done in high school. And one half of participants were asked to multiply this equation, so do this equation from in an ascending order from one to eight, so one times two all the way to eight. And another half of the participants were asked to do the same equation, but reverse, so eight times seven, so in a descending order. And they had a matter of five seconds to do this, so so the idea wasn't to calculate it properly, but to try to comfort, try to do a quick estimation. And what happened is people who received the first one, um, the average estimate was 512, while for the other group of participants, the average estimate was 2,250. Two and this shows really much the power of anchoring. So the first group was anchored by one times two, so just like one, it's a very small number, while the second group was anchored for eight times seven, so it's 56. And this led to a very, very big difference in the mean estimation, and the actual result is uh, 40,000. 320. So this is quite an incredible um, proof of anchoring and this is all around us. So it's the same idea um, if you randomly ask how old was Marilyn Monroe when she died and if you give a number older or younger than 60, people will be anchored to that number. But you could say older or younger than 20 or 80 and this irrelevant piece of information will really influence on your guess even though it, it's not relevant to actually how old she was when she actually died. <laughs> and then another example um, of some uh, other well-known, I think this is one of the strongest examples, the framing effect. And um, the idea of the framing effect is when you show a piece of information, depending on how you present it, people will have a very different judgment and preference towards a choice. And this is an experiment done by Kahneman and Tversky as well. And I think this really, really well represents the framing effect. So this is a hypothetical scenario that 600 people are affected by a deadly disease. And which treatment would you choose? So participants were asked to choose between these two treatments. 
A, um, treatment A, so 200 people will live, or treatment B, that 33% chance to save all 600 people and a 66% chance to save zero. And then if we move on to the next one, they were also asked to choose between these two scenarios. Again, the same situation, 600 people have this deadly disease. In this case, they were asked whether they would choose that 400 people will die or B, 33% chance that zero will die and a 66% chance that all 600 will die. And if we just see the actual results of this, it's quite incredible that in the first um, example, it was framed, treatment A was framed under a positive frame and 72% chose this. But when it was changed to a negative frame, so the same situation, whether 200 will live or 400 will die, uh, it dropped to 22% people selecting treatment A in the second version and 78% chose treatment B. And this is incredible because it shows that under certainty, people tend to be more risk averse and under uncertainty, we're going more towards risk seeking. And this is what the framing effect shows. And I think it's it's a very good representation. And this is all around us as well. And there's many famous examples. Like, I mean, just thinking when you buy um, disinfectant, whether you say 94, uh, kills 95% of bacteria or only 5% bacteria survive, the exact same information. But obviously, you would go for the first one because it's under the positive frame. And... The last one here um, is the social norms, which is, again, very, very um, common in behavioral science. So we use this as, both as a bias to understand how we behave, but also a lot of interventions are built on social norm interventions. And the idea of social norms is that people's behavior tend to go towards the median. And this is especially true if um, we want to identify with the groups around us. And this is a very famous study um, done in the U.S. by an O-Power study, and it's on energy conservation. And what they wanted to see is if we use a social norm intervention, whether people will change their energy consumption. And first, what, particip uh, what the researchers did is introduce a descriptive norm, which is comparing your behavior to that of the other. So they compared your behavior to the neighbors, whether you're doing better or worse than your neighbors. And what happened here is people who were consuming more than average actually reduced their consumption. But there was a, a boomerang effect, a negative effect that people who were doing quite well actually started increasing it. So they continued this study and they also introduced an injunctive norm, which is on the right, whether you're doing good, great, with um, representing with smiley faces. This is an injunctive norm of what is the expected behavior. And when this was introduced uh, to the study, this boomerang effect disappeared and actually there was a reduction in energy conservation overall. And this was a lot of um, a significant cost uh, saving in cost as well. Wow. I think we should do this. Yeah. When we are getting our electricity bill, <laughs> that okay, this is we good, should. great, or yeah. this is this is just average. It's just a lot of different types of social norms, so it's also important to understand which one you're utilizing. And if you're only using, for example, one, it can even have a negative spillover effect on some people. So it's very important to even understand the within group differences as well in this case, in this situation. And if you are going back to the, the stock exchange, you think more and more it's based on the human biases. So this is the reason why some stocks like explode and then like goes down. Yes, there's a lot of biases in there as well. So there's a lot of um, biases within behavioral finance that you can explore. And there's a lot of studies on stock exchange markets as well on how it influences, how different biases influence, how people sell, when they sell, and how they tend to keep even if they're losing um, stocks. So there is, there's a lot on this and it's very, very related to that as well. Because I read that more and more people, like average people, are going to the stock exchange and moving more and more money. And this is the reason why currently we are see seeing some like really crazy like like graphs. And this is the reason because these are average people, not like learn yeah. how the stock exchange works. And those group is, is much more based on biases, you think? Yes, definitely. Okay. And another question is how difficult it is to alter a human behavior? Yeah, that is, um, I think the answer, the short answer is it really, really depends. So there are some behaviors that are relatively easy to influence. And I would say that specifically within the scope of nudging, these behaviors tend to be ones where you have relatively low preference or no preference towards the outcome, or if you tend to be under high uncertainty. So taking an example, a very simple example, you're choosing between two restaurants. For example, if you're abroad in an unfamiliar country and one restaurant is full and the other one is empty, you will be very strongly influenced by your social norms and you will tend to go to the one that's full because you feel that those people will have more information and might know something that you don't know. However, if you already have certain preferences in this situation, let's say it's your local neighborhood, this is going to influence you less. So it's very important on whether people have preferences already. And in that situation, I would say often it's relatively easy to alter human behavior. So, for example, by nudging. 
Um, but then there are situations when it's very, very difficult. And this could be either if you already have strong preferences, but also if you have very strong inbuilt habits, because humans tend to be very habitual. It's very difficult to change habits in the long term and to achieve long term sustainable behavior change. So this is something definitely that has a big difference. But I would also say it depends strongly on whether um, what is the behavior we're trying to change and what is the influencing factor? Um, what is influencing that behavior? What are the different um, behavioral barriers and drivers in that situation? So if you look at recycling, are you not recycling because you don't have awareness of how to do it, because you don't have awareness of the consequences of not doing it, or because maybe the choice environment doesn't allow you to and doesn't make it easy? And this, again, is very, very different answer. On one case, bringing awareness and educating people is much more challenging versus making the choice environment or the choice architecture better, I would say, is much easier. So it, it really depends strongly on what is the behavior, whether you have preferences, and whether it's a contextual. So often it's easy to change behavior in one context. So you can um, maybe incentivize me to change my recycling behavior at the workplace, but that might not spill over to my recycling behavior at home. So it's also important that a lot of behavior is contextual. So while you might influence your behavior in one aspect, it might not actually come on to other areas of your life. So it's also important to that long-term sustainable behavior change is much, much more difficult. So if I would like to sell a product and it should change people's behavior, it, it wouldn't sell as well if, if I can just modify it a little bit by nudging. I mean, that is a one-time purchase. So that would be a purchase, right? So on how you sell a product, that would be shaping the decision. You can definitely use nudging there very successfully. But for example, making people go exercise regularly or changing your eating habits, that is not a one-time behavior. That is something that you need to persist over a longer period of time and overcome existing habits and introduce new habits. And in this situation, nudging is much more difficult. So it's a one-time nudge is not going to create a new habit. It might initiate a new behavior or you might need multiple nudges throughout, but there is much more than nudging in, in such in such uh, interventions that you need to take into consideration. And can you change change a, a behavior just by multiple uh, nudging or it's, it's not, not really possible? It depends uh, what we call by changing a behavior. So I would say that behavior is very contextual. So again, if a nudge happens in one context and it doesn't um, translate to another one, it might not be as effective. So um, here's some good examples of nudging that we can actually go through and show how these are very, very successful behavior change in terms of a very small specific example of nudging. But these not, don't necessarily work in more complex behavior. So actually, the first one uh, is a very cool one about wine. And what they've done is um, researchers started playing an ambient, stereotypical national French music in a supermarket. And because this um, it, this uh, triggered priming, so one stimulus um, introduced or influenced a reaction to another stimulus, increased the purchase of French wine by 500%. So this is one example, a very visual example of nudging. Another one on the bottom left is, this is a study done in London. There was very high antisocial behavior and vandalism in some neighborhoods. And what they've done actually is they painted baby faces on the storefronts of the shutter. So when you pull it down, and because baby faces tend to um, evoke caring, feelings of caring and reduce aggressive behavior, this led to a reduction of vandalism by 24%. So this is also a quite, a quite strong example of nudging. And on the top right, this is it goes a little bit more back. So this one is in 1998 and it wasn't done as a nudge, but we can consider it as a nudge. What happened is there was a very, very high um, paracetamol overdose in the UK. So I think an estimated 70,000 paracetamol overdose annually in the UK. And then they, in 1998, they introduced this blister packaging and because it was more difficult. So this was just a very small friction that you could easily avoid, but this tiny friction made it harder to swallow large amount of pills at the same time. And this led to a reduction of severe paracetamol overdose by 64%. So this is a very powerful example of how just introducing a friction can really, really lead to um, significant behavior change. And then the last one I think is the most famous one. It was in the Nudge book by, um, in 2008 by Taylor and Sunstein. Um, I think um, maybe some of the people already know this, but what they've done is in Amsterdam, Schiphol Airport, there was a very high um, spillage in the men's uh, bathroom and there was very high cleaning costs. So what they've done is they placed a stencil of a fly on the urinal and this aim, this um, made men to pay attention more to the activity and targeting. And therefore, this actually reduced village by 80% and significantly reduced the re uh, cleaning costs at the airport. So this is, again, a very, very small intervention that leads to a very strong um, behavior change as well. And can we use these nudges to, I don't know, exercise more, have better diets and um, save for retirement uh, or 
these are just for I don't know these these smaller cases. No, absolutely. So I I don't like to say everything is nudging. So nudging is one aspect of behavioral science. You can use different nudging uh, techniques for this as well, but I think it's much more complex than that. So for example, for exercising, there is obviously a lot of different types of interventions like making things easier, um, commitment devices, giving feedback on behavior. So if we consider these nudging as well, then yes, but there is a lot of different interventions that we can utilize to um, improve these behaviors and overcome bad habits. So for example, salience is a very good example for, um, let's say, recycling behavior. So if people are not um, aware of the long-term consequences of their actions, making the action more salient. So for example, saying that the plastic container to decompose takes 450 years. And these are salience examples that brings the the harmful consequences closer and more to the surface to the individual and will then nudge them towards, um, for example, recycling. So this is just a very simple example, but also time distortion is very important. So bringing future consequences closer to yourself because we tend to be very present biased. This can be very useful in saving for your retirement. So there is a very, very big scope of interventions that you can utilize um, in order to improve and overcome bad behavior. And uh, if you are intentionally changing or altering behavior, uh, or do you think it's ethical or where is the ethical limit? Yeah, so this is by far the biggest debate in behavioral science um, within, and also a little bit outside of behavioral science. So this is the biggest question to date. And of course, it depends. So um, behavioral science on the one side of the debate is it's great because you can help people make better decisions. You can help people follow through with their intentions. You can help overcome harmful um, harmful behaviors, both at an individual and at a societal level. Um, but then again, here nudging already has very rigorous definition. So it's important that nudging cannot be coercive. Nudging is something that doesn't significantly change one's economic incentive. So it's not a punishment. So if, for example, if we want to make people eat healthier by banning junk food or punishing people, that is not a nudge. And it also has to be very easy to opt out and to to forego that, so to not go for the desired decision. So that is important already in nudging and to define what is a nudge and what it isn't. So I think that's also something we need to consider that um, some people use nudging unethically or that it might be more coercive. And there's also things called um, dark, dark nudging or sludging. But on the other ha hand, there is a lot of ethical debate on, first of all, whether you can use the same toolkit, so the toolkit of behavioral science for harmful decisions. So if I can incentivize people to stop smoking, you can technically also incentivize people to start smoking. So this is one aspect of the ethical debate. And then the other one is more on the philosophical aspect on whether we're limiting people's autonomy and dignity. So people are being infantilized that they could be believing that we're helping them make these decisions that they're capable of making themselves. So this is very much on the other side. So I think what's really, really important is that practitioners understanding the very strong ethical standards of behavioral science. There's a lot of frameworks already developed for this. So for example, the Four Good Framework by Liam Delaney um, at LSC developed a framework that a lot of practitioners and um, policymakers use as well. But I think what's still dangerous at the moment is that often it's subjective. So there is not a one scaled ethical standard for all organizations and practitioners, but often it's subject to um, the individual's decision or the companies or organizations. But definitely um, it can be unethical, but I think that as long as people um, utilize these ethical standards and understand the, the ethical considerations behind this and follow these frameworks, then it can be used uh, very positively. And uh, if you are thinking about like negative actors, do you think like in the future we should have like a better like Im immune system for against biases? Because uh, I I think most of the people they will definitely use it for for good purposes. I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. But if there if there are negative actors, uh, I think most of the people should have some kind of like immune system against against this, or should they? Yes, ideally that would be great. Um, I'm not sure whether that is. I mean, this is something that's very innate to us, partially evolutionary. That is something that. Is, that happens to us because we have so many decisions to make and we have to rely on some shortcuts and that's why we cannot go through this rational utility maximizing decision making process every single time. So definitely people should be more aware, but not necessarily of their own biases, but of the tricks that people can use. So more aware of nudging, more aware of decoy effects, of defaults. So what is a default? So it's really when it's a it's results from inattention or people not having strong preference towards a decision, people might just stick with the default or people might be uh, manipulated by a decoy option that, you know, there's an additional option just so you're moving towards the desired outcome. So I think what they should be more aware of is the techniques and tricks you can use against yourself, not necessarily your biases, 
that would be great ideally as well but i think what what is more realistic is to be aware of these tricks and to be able to uh, protect themselves against them Currently, we are having more and more personal assistants like Siri and Alexa. Do you think in the future it, it will be possible if this personal assistant can like tell us, okay, this is probably a decoy, or there is like I don't know, eighty nine percent chance that this is a decoy? You should I don't know be more aware and think like in a different way, not just I don't know automatically accept it. I mean, that would be great. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is possible. Um, it hasn't been done so far, but. Um, I don't think that Siri necessarily would be able to tell you this, but I'm sure that there would be some more frameworks or more a standard way of understanding what is what is the trick going on here. And I also think that these are currently utilized across many industries, many people trying to sell products and services and experiences. And it's it's often already sometimes easy to acknowledge this, but obviously the general population is not aware of this. So I'm sure that there could be a more general understanding of this but i'm not sure if if siri could could tell me directly when i'm trying to purchase <laughs> something to go for the smaller coffee because they're <laughs> manipulating me to buy the bigger one but let's see let's see if we get there <laughs> yeah because i think on a website it could be like a web extension uh, yeah, probably it's... or or uh, if you're going to have like ar glasses it could automatically like re-rotate for us that it's a smaller cup but it would automatically say that okay this is like a trick this is a decoy yeah the problem is though that it's usually every nudge is different and every intervention is different and you would have to judge on an individual case Case. So it's very hard to say whether this is a nudge, whether this is some, whether this option exists for the purpose of nudging you to a certain option, or because there is a rationale behind that option. And you would have to have a very, very strong understanding of what is that product, what is the market, what is the competitors doing, what is the pricing. So I feel like it would be very, very high error rate um, in identifying what is what is a nudge or what is something manipulative, let's say, or a trick versus what is there just for people to choose. And also the other thing that People often talk about in behavioral sciences, everything is a choice architecture. So even if we intentionally shape a choice architecture, even if behavioral scientists don't intervene, there is still a choice architecture. So it's not something that didn't exist before. It's just um, creating an environment in order to um, purposefully drive towards a desired outcome. But either way, there is going to be a choice architecture. The question is who's deciding that and for what purposes. Yeah, but probably it could be like helpful information. So because yeah. I think most of the times, uh, like the system one and system two thinking, yeah. it could I don't know alert you that okay, you should you should change from a system one to a system two. Yeah, because, would be great. Yeah, because this is I don't know probably a trick. So you should think. The problem is about that it. there are so many system one decisions in a day and. It might not be efficient. I mean, when someone goes to a supermarket and choosing between different items, it even if you're in your system one and you might be, let's say, manipulated or tricked or or just based on your cognitive biases, if every time I was um, alerted that I'm in my system one, then it would take a lot more time to <laughs> to make every decision. And it might it might not necessarily lead to higher utility in that sense in terms of my time and effort and cognitive capacity. So that is also a question on, is it worth um, op optimizing those decisions? And uh, if you are speaking about behavioral science, uh, how did it start and, and where does it currently stand? Behavioral science has been around for some time. It was first popularized by, I would say, um, there is some argument on this, but by Kahneman and Tversky when they um, come up with the prospect theory, which is grounding on the theory of loss aversion. So people are people feel twice as much pain from a loss than from an equivalent amount of gain. And this is the idea that we don't necessarily decide based on outcomes, but based on a reference point. So I think it started a lot with Kahneman and Tversky. Before that, there was already quite a lot of work on bounded rationality by Herbert Simon. And then later on came the nudge theory. So um, Taylor and Sunstein with the book Nudge. So I think that's also when it came a lot of traction on nudging, the ethics of nudging. Can we use this for changing any behavior and how does this work? So I think that is also in 2008 when the Nudge book came out. Um, it gave, came with a lot of traction. And then today, actually, I mean, there's a lot of graduate programs. So in the last couple of years, so it's really, really increasing in popularity, both from the demand and the supply side. So there's a lot of graduate programs, mainly in the UK, US and the Netherlands. And there's also a lot of organizations um, creating behavioral science units internally and also um, government agencies. And then there's also a lot of behavioral science consultancies and um, chief behavioral officers, which are um, people who are responsible to um, create the behavioral science unit and division within larger organizations. So I think it's really, really increasing in popularity. I think currently in the UK and the US, it's the most um, it's the most ahead. But even in other regions of the world, I think like from India all the way to Hungary, um, there is uh, there's a lot of um, rising popularity in the field. Which are the fields that you think they are using it currently the most? And, and which are mm -hmm. the fields that currently it's, I don't know, predicted to move on? 
I would say there's a big difference between whether you use it in a public or private sector. So we're mainly focusing on the private sector. There is a lot of uh, work done in policymaking, but that's not something we focus on. So that is definitely the most widely used that came out from academia a little bit, and it's still more closer to academia. On the business side, I think one of the most use of behavioral sciences within finance and the financial sector, and also within healthcare, digital products. So a lot of behavioral science, I think, is currently used on digital products as well. We actually have most of our work in finance as well, so a very big majority on finance, but also in retail, a lot of it on different healthcare, t- telco. So it goes, it, it's, it has quite a lot of applications because it's rooted in the understanding of human behavior. And I mean, this is really, really relevant across, I would say, almost any industry. But I think... Uh, Currently, the most advanced or the most work has been done in the financial sector, and that's definitely here to stay. And I think um, in other, it, because it can be applied really to any virtually any context, it, it's going to further develop to other areas as well, like telco all the way to FMCG and, and other, um, other similar areas. And uh, how did you found this area? Yes, yeah, so um, I found it in my undergraduate degree. So I studied applied economics, and I, was, I just took a course on behavioral economics. And I was really, really quickly drawn to this field. So I instantly fell in love with behavioral economics and I started taking all different available courses in the university. I did my dissertation on this field as well. But in parallel, I was quite engaged in consulting. So I was doing a lot of workshops and um, case study competitions for different consultancies at the time. And I wanted to merge these two together. And then later on, I also did Uh, my master's in behavioral science at the London School of Economics, which was to really deepen my understanding, theoretical and quantitative understanding of behavioral science as well. So I really started this at Corvinus University, actually, in my undergraduate degree. And that is also when we started Beehive. Um, so, But a lot of people um, come from psychology, usually, also from neuroscience and other, co- and other social sciences as well. Uh, what is exactly Beehive, or can you describe yeah. it a little bit? Beehive is the first behavioral science consultancy in Central and Eastern Europe. And as I I touched upon this a little bit because behavioral science has, in short, two main aspects. One is really understanding human behavior and understanding why and how people make their decisions. And and the second part of this is once we have these insights from um, how people behave, is how can we actually influence this behavior to um, achieve the desired outcome. So this is the two main focus. And we do this through four main services, which are research, consulting, design, and a little bit separate is capability building. And within the research aspect, we really do a lot of rigorous um, research, both quantitative and qualitative, to understand the different influencing factors of a behavior, the barriers and drivers um, in uh, different challenges and behaviors. And we use these insights in order to develop behavioral interventions for products, services, and experiences. And then we also do behavioral design to provide end-to-end Um, solutions. And then we have capability building because it's very important specifically in this region to educate the clients and educate the people on what is behavioral science, what is the power of behavioral science, and how could they utilize it into their day-to-day work. So that is in short of what Beehive does. But I think some examples to give it a little bit more concrete on challenges we apply this for range from building trust, addressing misconceptions, shaping new habits and overcoming existing habits, all the way to um, understanding behavioral segmentation. So not shifting from demographic understanding and segmentations of users to making more behavioral segmentation, understanding people's unconscious preferences in a product. So what are people's preferences um, towards different features? What are people's willingness to pay? Um, how does perceived value affect um, your decision making and how can we shape perceived value? So these are just some of the general um, challenges and areas we tend to work with. Is there a case study where we can like follow th- through a little bit how, how it's actually being done? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of different cases, but how a project usually looks like um, is it starts with research. So we always, almost always have a quite long research phase um, where we, for example, one of the recent work we've done with Volksbank, it's a German bank, and we did this together with a digital transformation agency in Germany. The project was, is a, Volksbank had this product um, regarding generational consulting, and this is a service that is provided in Germany. It's similar to advanced care planning, like in the UK. The idea is when people are not able to make decisions um, and when they're older or they're not in a state when they can make their own decisions, is to have these decisions um created earlier regarding their healthcare and financial aspects. And what they were doing is they had to digitalize this whole process. So from this in-person, really lengthy and difficult process of going to the bank, talking to the consultants, building your family tree, all the way to you know giving all your financial information and so on, they had to move this online. And what where we came in in this project is to how can we shift this really emotionally and cognitively straining process and make it more human-centric for the user 
specifically the older generation, because in average, this service is designed for the older generation. So we started with a really rigorous research phase on understanding people's um, attitudes to towards generational consulting. What are their main fears? How can we increase trust in this situation? What are people's perceived value around this? Um, how can we ease the cognitive um, strain on this, uh, cognitive and emotional strain? And then later on, this came to intervention design on creating different behavioral science interventions to build trust for towards the service. So decreasing the perceived risk of, for example, uploading your documents or giving personal information about your family and health, all the way to making the whole process easier. So making it, there was a very big problem regarding awareness and knowledge because it is a very, very complex process. So simplifying the information in a way that is understandable to the user and also um, making it more human centric in a way that it's emotionally easy to follow through and you may feel more comfortable giving this information. So this was a quite comprehensive um, process, starting from a lot of research, both primary research, a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, behavioral audits conducted here and user testing as well, all the way to behavioral intervention design. Um, and this was done together with a digital agency um, who was actually developing this product for Volksbank. How many people uh, do you usually like, like do a research with and uh, do you usually do it, uh, I don't know, like 50% male, 50% female or different like generations or how do you, I don't know, get this group together? It really depends on what is our target. So who are we studying? Um, of course, usually and, and almost always we have to do a representative study. It depends what we call representative, but on average, it depends how many clusters and behavioral segments you want to create and what part of the population we're looking at. But um, yes, for example, if it's representative, then it has to be according to the country. So representative to gender, to education, to income, to age, and all of that. Um, it really ranges on how many participants we need. But just to give you an approximate estimate, it could be from 1,500 to 2,000. Um, this can also be quite pricey because we have to pay for these participants most of the time. So it depends if you purchase the participants or there is existing clients of um, the, the client of the customer or the client on the projects, but then they also have to provide incentive to fill it out. So definitely we go for representativeness, um, but it always depends on who our study is. I mean, whether we're studying Gen Z, whether we're studying some very specific, like only C-level executives in a given environment. So it, it really depends. It's not, it's usually not the same, same population twice. Yeah. And uh, if there is a, the, the same product for like two completely different groups, uh, do you have to like segment also some somehow the product or go into different routes or how, how can you like manage that? In terms of the outcome, like the intervention? Uh, yeah, yeah, because um, I, I can imagine a situation where like women like different color than like men and it's, it, it completely affects the, the behavior completely different. And I don't know, after yeah. a question, I don't know, are you male or female uh, after the flow is completely different or after, I don't know, your income, after your, I don't know, like position or something like that, you are you are getting a completely different flow? I mean, the, if we're talking about a, a survey, for example, or like a decision simulation, which is a survey format, but it's it's a bit more complex than a survey, the flow itself is not different. So they they have to, for example, in this situation, uh, uh, they would have to be facing a decision environment where they have to make different choices, for example. But what is different is the outcome. So we have to understand later together with the client on who is our target group and how much weight we want to give to different target groups. So yes, as you're saying, if women prefer one color and men prefer a different color or this generation prefers a, um, one, one font and the other one a different one, um, you cannot have three different fonts on the app. I mean, in most in most cases. So this is a lot on actually understanding the different and um, target size, the target group, their size, and who we want to focus on. So it's not about um, you know creating every for every target group a different solution. Of course, that can be. But when we're talking about communication techniques or personalization, then it can be much more personal in that sense. But in general, um, it's it's not that for every outcome we have a different um, you know solution. But actually, you could create an application where you would have, I don't know, four different solutions for different like targeted groups, and it would probably work much better than having you like could. a single solution. I mean, that would depend on the client. So that's obviously, if it's someone else's product that has, it's bounded by certain things. There are a lot of um, cases where you can have more personalized offers or personalized. There's also uh, on some platforms already, you can select the different font, whether you have any um, inabilities and you might need different colors or color blindness. So there are a lot of things like this, but there's still um, quite a few companies who are employing that at the moment. So in the long term, definitely it's going to go towards more personalization and personal ju user journeys, um, depending on your needs, depending on your behaviors, your personality, your demographics and so on. And uh, how can you decrease uh, risk or, or people feeling like, like that is a riskier solution, like in, in general? 
in what sense? Sorry, what so risky it, for it, what? You mentioned that they would like to upload the document, and it's, oh. it's a, like a risky thing. And how can you make it like less mm -hmm. less, less risky for the people? So there is a lot of different ways. So one thing is, for example, uh, it's called hierarchical hierarchical cognitive association. So you're comparing it to some trusted source. So if you're talking about banking, let's say Revolut, it always says that it's connected to this bank, or it says that this much of your money is secured with them. So by creating a connection towards something uh, as a trusted institution. That is, for example, one way of creating trust, also great creating feedback, utilizing the messenger effect, which is who is communicating the information to you will affect how you judge that information and whether you trust that information. So you can also do research on who should the messenger be. It can also be information on um, how can you be more transparent and, and provide better information to understand the service better. So reassurance messages, feedback on behavior. So there is so many ways that um, you can actually, um, for example, increase trust or feeling of security. It really depends on, on what we're looking at, or whether this is a product, a financial product, a healthcare related product. But there's a lot of tools um, that has been empirically proven to increase or, for example, improve the feelings of safety. And uh, so last question, uh, how do you see like we have in the next like five, 10 years? Actually, we're going much more international at the moment. So while Beehive is based in Budapest and our office is in Budapest, um, we are, do operate globally and we have very international team and also clients. And we also have quite a lot of advisors and partners um, globally, mainly in the UK, actually, at the moment and also in the US. So we're definitely uh, looking into other markets and expanding behavioral science and taking it to other markets in Europe as well because um, we wanted to ensure that we bring this knowledge back to Hungary initially. So um, most of us studied abroad and behavioral science in, in business has not really been present in Hungary before. So that is our first goal. And currently we're looking into other markets from Germany, um, UK and uh, the US as well in taking behavioral science there and having another office there as well. And also the other important reason for going more global is most of the talents are actually currently in the UK, but also um, mainly it's not that many behavioral scientists in Hungary. So we also need to expand the team and build a more international team for in the future. Yeah, good luck for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I always ask at last, uh, how can people find you or, or Beehive? Yeah, so um, you can find us on our website, which is beehive.consulting. And you can also find us on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook under the same name. So Beehive Consulting. Uh, Rachel, thank you for the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. If you like this episode, you can follow us on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and uh, Spotify. And uh, until the next one. Bye.